Hi everybody, I'm Roxanne. I'm from Cambridge in the United Kingdom, even though you might detect an Australian accent. Um, and I was part of the PCC course last year. Um, and our group um, from last year were all chatting about how great it would be to catch up and see what we were doing in each other's countries. And then we thought, why not extend that to everybody from every year of PCC? And then we thought, um, why not to everybody who's taking part in the MOOC? And then actually, why not just everybody in the entire world who's interested in the world domination of cycling? So literally within about 48 hours, we've gone from a chat with about 30 people to whatever we end up with today. Um, so I'm the executive director of Cambridge Cycling Campaign. And for me, I'm really interested in how we um, capitalized on this moment as so many people are, are going to be doing uh, but how do we use this crisis to put forward the case for um, active travel and better urban environments um, and of course uh, we know that New Zealand is leading the way so why not hear from New Zealand about what they're doing and see what we can learn so um, I know we're all working on these theories of change for our local context, but I think that if we can all align and have a global movement, we're all going to be even stronger uh, in our own countries. And I'm also really interested in what we do in the short term, the medium term, and, and then what that means for the longer term um, for our, our countries and our cities. Uh, and if this goes well, hopefully we'll end up with a series of talks from different countries. Uh, and we can focus on uh, what each country is doing, uh, perhaps uh, have different hosts every time, different time zones so that everybody can be included. Uh, but we'll see how we go today. So what we're going to do to start with is uh, we've got Patrick Morgan, who is from uh, the PCC class last year. Patrick is going to uh, kick off with some context around what's going on in New Zealand. And then we'll have Claire Pascoe talk about you know, what is actually happening tactically on the ground there right now. Um, but apart from that, I'm going to now give the floor to the experts. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and let's see how we go. And thank you so much, Marco, for really getting behind our little idea and making it huge. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Okay, uh, kia ora. Welcome everyone from Wellington, New Zealand. It's about uh, 9 p.m. At, on Thursday night here. It's really good to see you all. I'm really glad that you showed up for this. A bit of context, um, you know, New Zealand really uh, is not, a, a not, not an old country and our cities are more or less based on a North American um, model of planning. So there's a lot of suburban sprawl. We don't have those, those old European city centers. So we're a very car dependent country um, and a lot of problems go with that as you all know. But more recently, people are seeing the limits of that um, way of planning our cities. And there's been a real embrace of the bicycle. Uh, politics changed in New Zealand a couple of years ago with the election of a new government. And believe it or not, our Associate Transport Minister is uh, someone with a, some of you probably met her, wave at me if you have. Uh, Julianne Genter is a, a professional transport planner and a, a daily she rides a bike daily for, um, for transport. So you might think all your problems are over. You've got this transport minister who knows what she's about. She's in government. The money will flow and projects will get built. Well, I learned one thing in, well, a lot of things in Amsterdam last year, but one was that things aren't that simple, that we take more of a systems approach to problems and you can't just pull one switch and everything will fall into place. So, where we've got to today is that um, there's a, a modest amount of money from the government which is available to our cities to invest in, it's called the Innovating Streets Program, which is, uh, I guess, a, a government way of, of talking about tactical urbanism. It was really just announced quite recently and we've yet to see cities grasp the opportunity and make of it. It could be wider footpaths, it could be uh, pop-up bike lanes, great public spaces like we've seen overseas. Can we show you any finished projects? Not yet, but watch this space. So I think at this point, I will, um, I will introduce Claire. Now, Claire was the person responsible for getting me on this course. She went in 2018 and came back and raved about it. And um, here we are today. 
So introducing Claire Pascoe, she works as the lead advisor on urban mobility at New Zealand Transport Agency. In that job, she's providing technical expertise and leadership across policy planning and performance to ensure that transport investment results in high quality urban environments that provides people with transport choices. So Claire will shortly be talking to the recently released Innovating Streets package uh, with funding for our local city councils to access and backed up by government last week with the possibility of additional funding for cycleways. Um, but more than that, um, Claire has been a really good friend to me over many years. She has a background both in uh, central government and local government and before that as, as the leader of one of our bicycle advocacy groups. So um, Claire, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I will assume some nodding. Yes, cool. Um, so yeah, kia ora everybody. Thanks so much for this. I, I have a few disclaimers um, before I start, but I would just like to take the opportunity to shout out to the 2018 class. Yes. Um, us also maybe manage the hype a little around the New Zealand response right now. We've got a great PR machine clearly happening around the world. Um, but yeah, just sort of setting some expectations that we are building the plane as we fly it um, and definitely have not got this thing all sorted out. So I really look forward to hopefully at the end hearing and getting to share some thoughts. Um, I'm just going to try and see if I can share the old screen. Can everybody see that? Yep, okay, cool. I'll just make it uh, big. So um, what I was going to talk about today, I wanted to um, just introduce, because before we got to the COVID response, um, we were working on this Innovating Streets pilot fund. And so some of the reason that we've been able to pivot, I guess, to um, having this national response is because of this thing we were working on before. So I wanted to just spend a little bit of time giving some context of what we were working on um, and then explain the kind of pivot um, and how really what we're doing now is writing a whole bunch of national permission slips. So I'll whiz through this kind of quickly, but um, as Pat was saying, we this Innovating Streets for um, People Fund is basically tactical urbanism. We tried a whole bunch of bureaucratic government speak, um, but have recently just come back to calling it tactical urbanism because, you know, people understand that. So I, Mike Leiden, you know, I think he, he everybody will probably hear no of Mike and um, his great work in this space, but I think his definition is one of the best ones in, in terms of um, explaining that the, the short-term, low-cost and scalable projects are actually intended to catalyze long-term change, and that's something that we've been really trying to get across down here is that these projects aren't just um, for fun, they're actually intended to test something and experiment and, and advance a story of permanent change in the future. So that's been um, something that we have spent a while now um, trying to explain. So we, we talk about the difference between a pop-up, a pilot and a semi-permanent, or sometimes we call that an interim, um, that they're working on different time frames, that they're there for different purposes, that you use different materials, um, you might use a mixture of them, so you might do a one-day pop-up that then leads to a few months pilot to kind of work your community all the way along to a permanent um, state. So some of these, this is probably really familiar with, you know, for a lot of you, we drawing inspiration from around the world, really, from Barcelona, from South America, from Canada. This is our own homegrown Play Streets event this is France, um, you know, we were seeing this happening all around the world and we wanted to get good at it here in New Zealand. So um, in terms of how we were framing and talking about this, we had started with our new government really looking for a paradigm shift in our towns and cities in terms of the way we talk about transport. So a system that puts well-being and livability at the heart. And that was really new language and quite a shift in our thinking of transport. But lots of what we are talking about, the sorts of transformational change that we're after, involves really long-term, really expensive, really difficult 
projects. And the reality is that all of the crises that we're trying to address at the moment need change that's faster than that. So this is my really basic graph that I use everywhere. This is the extent of my Microsoft drawing skills. But this is our rate of change that we had and this is what the rate of change that we're after. Alongside that, we know, and everybody who's been, been to the course knows, nobody, you know, everybody thinks they want change, but they don't want to change. And so it's all very well having these great transformational visions, but actually what's our approach to getting people along that road? And as I think, you know, all of us working in the space have become really familiar with in the last few years, that transitional approach um, is a very good way to do that. So in New Zealand, we've tried, we dabbled, we did some stuff. Um, and what we found is that it was really, really hard when we started um, asking people, why is nobody doing this? Why does this seem so hard? We found that it was really hard. And there were a lot of um, institutional system reasons for why it was hard. So somebody, I thought this was brilliant, explained what it was like trying to do tactical urbanism in New Zealand like this, but like snakes and ladders with no ladders. So basically our system just wasn't set up for this process that wasn't business as usual. And it kept running into barriers. So the, the idea for the Innovating Streets for People program was for us nationally to start to unpick some of all these barriers. And there were heaps of them. So there was this element where there was no legitimacy to this stuff. People didn't recognize it. Nobody wanted to take a risk to do something different. Nobody had said they could. Um, there were investment things. Our business case approach didn't always allow for it. Um, we had some regulatory and legislative barriers. So we have a thing called the traffic control device rule, which I will not uh, go into, but also our temporary traffic management codes. All of these things were the reasons that these projects were dying. So for the last year, we've been working on unpicking all those system barriers. And what we realized early this year is we needed more than that. So that's when this idea of a pilot fund came up which was an opportunity to really stimulate a ton of interest. We know that incentivizing through funding stimulates interest and it helps overcome that kind of barrier to entry. People are willing to take a few more risks, do things a little bit differently if there's money in the table. So we wanted to use that, I guess, age old approach to try and drive a real lift in capability um, and embed some new uh, processes so that we can do this. So the sorts of projects that were, are going to be able to be applied for the fund were, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods, one-off big events like the Ciclavia type things, um, street revitalizations, intersection safety treatments, all these sorts of things we've been seeing around the world. And then um, because people, you know, it, we actually found it easier to start to explain what we wouldn't fund. So we wouldn't fund plonking stuff in the street for no reason because it looked fun. Um, we wouldn't fund stuff that was cheap but that was permanent. We wouldn't fund stuff that wasn't aligned to what we were trying to achieve. And we're not going to fund super cool, funky art programs that we think are awesome but that have nothing to do with reimagining the transport system. So that helped us get a bit more clarity. But then, do do, um, pivot. So coronavirus hit. Uh, about two weeks before we were due to launch the fund. Um, this is my favorite mountain bike at the moment that I'm thinking of buying, and it happens to be called Pivot, so I just wanted to show off the beautiful picture of it. But, um, you know, before we knew it, we had sort of announced almost, not accidentally, but <laughs> without going through a huge amount of planning, that this fund that we were about to launch is now part of our COVID-19 response and is there to fund quite a different, in a way, type of project. So. Um, we, we picked up this term that Mike Leiden is so good at introducing new bits of jargon, which I love, this idea of tactical resilience. Um, and we tapped into what's happening all around the world. So, you know, the issues that you will all be seeing, more people on narrow footpaths, vehicle speeds that are going faster because the roads are empty, people that can no longer use public transport looking for other ways to get to essential work. Um, and so those are the challenges now that the fund is also available for. Um, we would expect to see interventions like footpath extensions, partial or full road closures, emergency bike lanes. Um, yeah, so 
what something that's happening in New Zealand is, and I don't know if this is happening around the world, our Prime Minister, our government introduced these alert levels, which is really the framework for our response. And, and we're all now, a month ago, we had no idea about alert levels, and now we're completely fluent in the language of alert level. But we've tried to almost shape some of this thinking around the alert levels. So at, at level four, which is what we're in right now, which is complete lockdown, we're thinking that our response is about um, ensuring safe network operations. So that's those people spilling out off the footpath with the vehicle speeds and creating places that people can socially distance um, on the street. At level three, which we hope might be going to next week, we will expect to see more people moving to more types of work in some school. So the um, focus will be a little bit more on providing those alternative transport options where public transport will still be probably avoided for a while. And then at two and one, it's really thinking back to that strategic link with how do we find opportunity through this disruption so as you all will be experiencing, this is what's going on here. And I'm sure it's what's going on everywhere. Um, these are the scenes that we're seeing on our streets at the moment. And of course, we're thinking like everybody, how do we take this um, disruption and, and leverage it for positive change that's going to endure? So um, with all of that in mind, what we're working on right now is adapting our funding process so that we can immediately release money for these projects. We're developing some guidance that we're hoping to have by next week, which is basically the why, where, and how for each of those types of interventions, so the footpath extensions and the road closures. And then we're making sure that we've got really clear comms. We've got this new thing called the National Emergency Management Agency, um, and they're basically the the, the word on everything we can and can't do right now. So if we want to allow things, it has to come through them as a message. So we're working with them to try and make sure that um, things that happen don't get unhappening <laughs> um, at different levels. So basically what, what I wanted to say is that our role in this at a national level is writing all the permission slips. We aren't actually, we haven't actually seen, as far as I know, anything on the ground yet. We've had one council that put something in at 6 a.m. last Saturday and had it undone by 9 a.m. Um, and that was because of this different level saying, yes, you can, no, you can't. So what we're trying to do is find all those system things, in, uh, which we've been doing for the last three days. So the legislation, what says you can lower speed limits, what says you've got a power to close a road and make sure everybody's on the same page of the permission that you have to do this stuff. And then we'll release the money and fingers crossed something happens, but we're not really there yet. So it's a bit of an anticlimactic story, I'm afraid. Um, and the last point, is of course like this whole couple of weeks has been making me think about the, the great work that Luca um, talks about system change and transition design and the theory of um, system change I guess and, and we've never in our lives and may never again have a landscape change like this and so that time for innovation is the ripest it will ever be, um, which means, I mean, that's, I guess, why we're all together. But it took us a little while, for me anyway, emotionally to let go of everything we had prepped for that's innovating streets. We worked really hard on our messaging and our framework, and then we had to pivot. And it was almost like an emotional release to say, okay, let it go. We try all our lives to be relevant. We're relevant, like just go with it and pivot. So yeah, that's kind of our story. And I'll um, hand back over to Roxanne if you wanna have questions or just chat. Thank you, Claire. Sorry, I was stuck on mute. I was being very good in making sure I was muted. Um, that was a roller coaster, and my brain is already exploding with with thoughts of. Really, my first initial reaction to that is just, why can't we all be like New Zealand, <laughs> and and coordinated? And I think it's coming across so clearly from New Zealand. Um, there is this level of organisation and communication across all streams in the reaction to the pandemic which is really enabling this to happen. Even at a local council level here, we aren't as coordinated as you are as an entire nation. Um, but anyway, let's hand this over to questions. Um, 
I'll see if we've got any in the chat. Nothing in the chat yet. So would anyone like to put their hand up and unmute and ask a question of Claire or Patrick? Let's see. Uh, we've got a question here. Claire, the fund isn't a lot of money, but it is honey to attract attention. The real innovation is the permission slip. I agree. What do you think, Claire? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the money's been a complete distraction. Um, and we've had a whole bunch of people asking about the amount. And actually, we're not entirely sure of the amount, to be honest. Um, and, and we're just trying to give a clear message that it doesn't matter. Don't worry about that. Put your best projects together and apply. And what for a lot of these projects it will be is uh, it's a process that gets unlocked. It's not always a big dollar cost to figure out a new way to make a decision. Um, so yeah, I think that's totally right. The money is a bit of a distraction. Also, just I'll be really keen to hear um, what some of the other interventions that countries are doing around the world because we're desperately trying to take notes. I think that's the key point, Claire, is that it, it's for many people, there's maybe a willingness to do it, but just a how on earth with the policies and the regulations that we currently have, how can we actually implement these changes is a really big question. And I think you're lucky that you were so far down that path already to, to help unlock that. Whereas I know in other countries, you know, just to get any kind of regulation order to install something is really difficult. Right, Claire, can you unshake also... your screen? There's, there's a question from Robin already asked earlier is um, the NZTA Innovating Streets Funding Program has disappeared off their website today. Has something happened to it? No, that is a good thing to know and I will follow that up. <laughs> Uh, another question from Julieta. How did you manage to get agreement with the other road user networks, bus, freight, etc., to manage these quick approvals? Actually, I'd be intrigued to know how do you actually create this permission slip program where you can sign that and know that all the other departments are going to allow things to happen? Well, the funny thing is, in an emergency, um, well, there's a few acts, there's, there's legislation that kicks in down here. So we've got a Civil Defence Emergency Act that has a few powers and there are some powers around road closures. So this is not us, um, this is not us writing anything new. This is just uncovering the abilities for, that you can do. Um, the other thing is there's an emergency speed limit um, setting rule, which I didn't know until a few days ago, which means that you can lower speeds through an epidemic, which is considered an emergency. So a lot of it is just um, digging out and rabbit holing what you can do and then saying it out loud um, because people are looking for permission. Um, but, but there's heaps, I mean, it's been an absolute um, minefield trying to find all the right people to talk to because now there's like three or four more agencies than there normally are to talk to. So you do a lot of um, phone calling. <laughs> We've, we've found your, your website again. It has been relocated. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, if we've got other questions, we've got one from Mark. Uh, what processes will central government retain to punish and or speed up local authorities who take too long to deliver? Now, that's not really how we're rolling. So um, we, the whole thing of this is we are here to get out of your way and that's um, definitely the kind of vibe of the program is getting ourselves out of the way. So it's not really a enforcing or, you know, um, kind of punishing vibe. It's more, a, we know you want to do these things. Some of the stuff's hard. We're trying to make it easier. But there'll be no kind of like follow up. The, the fund is kind of limited. So it'll be first in, first serve, really. So we've got a question from Bernardo. Uh, new open cities all over streets become car free globally. Um, Portugal, Lisboa is also on board. Uh, how do you recommend that innovative car reducing city policies transmit for govern national governments, national action? Does that make sense? Bernardo, you might have to come and explain that one for us. Well, um... What I mean is, if cities are implementing policies, Lisbon is studying a series of policies to be implemented over the next few weeks, um, but that's not the case with surrounding municipalities, and they have a lot of road space allocated to um, 
Road Infrastructure uh, Management Agency, the National Road Infrastructure Management Agency. Uh, how can you transmit to national level, because that's what New Zealand is doing, um, how can you transmit these policies to national level? We have a few advantages. Um, one, Catherine and I, Catherine King and I are very passionate about this and we both work in a national agency, so that, that's helpful. Um, I think we're also really lucky, we not lucky, but in this situation, we don't have a state government. So the national government is really close to the local councils um, and there's almost no in between and that makes it much easier. So I, I, don't, I think we've got a bit of an easier road than other countries in this space, but I would say doing some digging around your national legislation and finding what powers they might have that they don't know they have or aren't utilizing could, yeah, could find, uncover something. I can't imagine what that's like, Claire. I have to work with seven levels of government just in Cambridge, a city of 120,000 people. <laughs> just can't imagine. Um, okay, a question from Fiona. How will councils decide what projects to do? Um, and can we suggest they trial some major cycle routes where councillors are stalling? Yeah, so I think in the immediate term, councils, we're starting to get some conversations from them today. They're looking at a few things. They're looking at um, partial road closures, particularly near shed paths or parks where heaps of people are going. So um, one of our cities has recorded three times the number of pedestrians on a shed path than there normally is. And there's just not the space for the social distancing. So some of these projects are very site specific to expanding those. Some of them um, are using the opportunity to think a little bit more strategically about their long-term plan. So they're looking at their city centres and their footpath widths, and they're looking to how can they double or triple them through this period of social distancing, um, given that it's sort of in line with what they're wanting to do with their town city in the future. So they're already finding that strategic link. But some of them, it's more just about right now, we've got an absolute problem that people can't socially distance on that footpath, so we need to fix that. I think that's particularly helpful for councils that are resistant. This isn't even about active travel. This is about social distancing is, is a way to, to get that in. Um, it's also about safe network operations. So because of those vehicle speeds, people are, are, are jumping off and going around onto the road as cars are going faster than they normally do. So that's sort of the way we are fr framing it as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, a question from, from Linda about um, managing our return to work and school, which is, feels like a, a long time away in some places. Um, but what about uh, as people are staying away from public transport, they're getting more into their private cars. Um, how can we manage that transition back to the new normal life? Yeah, and for us, that's where we're starting to think about alert level two in particular. So for, for us, that is starting to transition back to normal life. And that's where we, I guess I see the biggest opportunity for leveraging, okay, everybody's got something really different from their mind. They've just reimagined their streets completely. Now they're going back. How do we now think about interventions that are very aligned with our strategic objectives and start pivoting more towards um, projects that are more of that nature. Yeah. Um, do you have any tactical urbanism measures uh, that are being used to reduce speeds rather than just the reduction of speed limits? Uh, that's a question from Ray. Yeah, what we are imagining, um, <laughs> because remember, we haven't got any of these done yet, um, is that some of the footpath extensions and the partial road closures will have a really a positive impact on vehicle speeds too. So where we're narrowing the road space to extend the footpath space, that'll have some natural traffic calming um, impacts. Goodness, the questions are coming through thick and fast now. <laughs> um, oh, we've got a suggestion from, from Zolt. Uh, one of the low cost, easy things to do could be reprogramming traffic signals to help mm. people avoid pressing <laughs> buttons. I'd be interested to know what's going on in New Zealand. I know Australia is doing a bit of this. Are any other countries um, reprogramming traffic signals? Put your hand up and we'll find you. Start with you, Claire. I had a really interesting chat about this today. 
There are some, we did this, and there are some real um, things to think about, like residents who are suddenly getting the ding, 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 crossing noise every few minutes, and there were a whole bunch of noise complaints coming from residents. So there's all these um, interesting unintended consequences, um, and I think being able to tell people that they don't need to push the button's important, because if they don't know that that thing's automated, they're still pushing it. And it's yeah. the only thing they can hear. Yeah. Mark, were you saying something as well? Go, Mark. Yeah, I'd love to offer some insight on the push button automation. <clears throat> I've sat through traffic committee meetings at the City of Sydney, which have gone on for many years where that's been requested. Uh, to either, uh, eradicate the signal, to make the signal automated. Uh, or get rid of the signal altogether and of course it was impossible uh, uh the traffic committee which is predominantly the traffic authority uh said no but suddenly a crisis allows you to do all sorts of interesting things but even after that was done the behavior change piece that was really interesting was that the do not push push this button were ineffective people kept pushing the button because it turns out that in the public domain the public are almost entirely blind to signs because they're surrounded by them all the time so they've now had to design a new sign which actually is almost like a slip that physically covers the button so that you uh, have to push the sign in order to push the button uh, because otherwise people just they don't see it at all. Mark do you think that this could be a permanent change does it feel like this could stick around or is it very much we're only doing this temporarily? That's a great question and that's something I've been thinking about for all of the changes we're seeing. Claire, for your program, for things like the uh, pedestrian controls in the city of Sydney, uh, other stuff that I'm seeing around the world. I really want to believe that this can be sort of the gateway drug to long-term change but then I keep looking back to sort of here is the way that society has acted historically after crisis and usually we sort of we, we we don't maintain good behaviors if you look at the oil crisis or if you look at the depression what happened afterwards was sort of everyone went, went a bit went a bit wild on consumption and uh, 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 sort of you know doubling down on their old behaviors um, so while I'm optimistic I'm also a bit of a skeptic that some of these good behaviors will be maintained it requires policy and regulation change, not just relying on behaviour change, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and public buy-in. Yeah. Oh, this is a good one. It's about how do you avoid creating destination projects and create more system-wide changes? And um, my interpretation of this is that we, we can't create these interventions that encourage lots of people to come to these spaces, which in normal times might actually be an objective. So, um, so how do we create these system-wide changes, but also avoid being seen to be creating projects to attract people to public spaces when they should be distancing? Uh, and that question uh, was from Andy. I mean, I can have a go, but I just want to say I'm no expert in this, but so I'd really love if somebody else to jump in. Um, I, I think that one thing that's important for us right now is to really differentiate the different types of projects. So if this is uh, an emergency response to crowding, then there will be some destination projects that are about dealing with things that are in a particular site. Um, but some of the things that we're also encouraging um, at a more network level are kind of low traffic neighbourhoods. So how can we look at using, um, you know, road closures or one way streets to start to get this low traffic neighbourhood area wide approach going um, but it'll be interesting to see if, if people pick that up yeah uh, I've got a hand up from Bryn uh, Bryn go for it or Brian I hope I've got that right Bryn, hi Claire um, I was wanting to know uh, what are you doing to engage with people like Mike Hoskin who uh, amplifies resistance to change Great question, Bryn. For everybody else, Mike Hosking is a New Zealand broadcaster who um, is very uh, polarising, let's just put it. So, Bryn, what I'd say to that is absolutely nothing. We went on a really great course recently about communicating for change, and one of the best things we took out of that was um, don't give oxygen to your opposition. Don't myth bust. Don't just get even in that space. You've got your... Um, your converted, your persuadables, and then your hard to persuade, and your persuadables is the space you want to be in. So it's just not even worth going down those alleys. 
good advice. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll chip in there. Um, working as a as a cycling advocate in New Zealand, I often have to field these calls. Um, and I, yeah, I agree with what Claire says. The the people we're trying to get to are the people in the middle, the persuadables. Our job is to give messages that our base supporters will amplify and repeat. Um, and we're really trying to reach those persuadables. Sorry, just back on the previous point about um, big buttons at pedestrian signals. What's that? Okay, so with some duct tape and a rock, I challenge you to go out this afternoon and see if you can hack the big button on your pedestrian signal to, uh, to get it into the on position and Ooh. report back. Tell me how it goes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, so we've sort of ended up with two, two threads here, but I think they're both really interesting to explore. So we're still on this, uh, the situation of um, creating destinations as opposed to these system-wide changes. How do we balance that out and how do we also make sure we're not encouraging too many people to new spaces? Uh, but then also we've got this communicating for change. So um, I'm interested to see if anyone else wants to chip in on those two, two issues or questions before we move on to any others. You can pop your hand up or just go for it, unmute and jump in. Yeah, I, I put a question in the chat. It was really about um, the uh, awareness around the, the the permanence of the intention of tactical urbanism as a mechanism for change. Uh, a lot of the media here and people I talk to are kind of that's all very new for them, and they they latch on to this idea of pop ups. So I'm just wondering how we're going to see some more kind of. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, if the councils understand that it's about permanence that we're that they're uh, engaging in. That's been one of the real challenges of this pivot for COVID-19 is that there are some projects now because of the emergency response that may not lead to permanence. They're about sorting an immediate problem out. Um, but I think every, and, and that's made it hard to communicate the primary objective of the fund, which was about these projects that have a pathway to permanence. So, so we're just going to try and do our best to sort of say, look, there, there's this little thing that's for this specific purpose. But what this is all about is, is you know, you, you testing, piloting, experimenting to something else. You know, like Mike Clyden talks about, you're not planning a project, you're telling a story. So what is the story you're telling through these? I think that's also really important is gathering the evidence. So even if it's a project in one location, that might not be the permanent location, but you're just gathering evidence to build that support for future projects in other locations. All right, I'm just checking anyone else on those issues or I'll move on to new questions. If I can chip in on the uh, not creating a destination thing. Hi, uh, Letter House. Um, uh, I think if you if you have created a destination, you just haven't gone far enough. I think you need to make sure that you're, you you create a network and not just a single place because people love to flock to a place. But as you create a network, uh, it'll be large enough to accommodate a lot of people. Uh, I think a good example from Oakland, not Auckland, but Oakland in uh, California, they've just created 100 kilometers of, of open streets instead of just doing a single one. And I think that's yeah, go bold or don't do it at all. Excellent. Uh... Zoltz. Hi there, yeah, I'm Zolt here in the UK. I'm in a, I guess, a city of 120,000 people. Um, and we've been trying to do some of the stuff like, um, you're talking about New Zealand in terms of these innovative street programs. And the biggest, the biggest challenge has been the comms with, internally with other council officers about, you know, how to move beyond being conservative you know, as your slide said, we we want to do check. We want we want change, but how the hell do we do it? And I, I think some of that communication, as you, as you've just said, in terms of um, this isn't about active travel, but it's about the social distancing. I think might help internally in terms of the local government communications. And um, the challenge we've had locally is is also who's going to do it because um, a lot of the local authority staff have been redeployed for delivering local meals um, and the highways contractors have, have down tools as well so there's the kind of challenge as you push it through the system of who is going to do this 
in um, in New Zealand, we had a list really, uh, well, it took a little while, but they clarified what an essential service is or what essential work is for different um, different industries. And what was deemed essential for transport was the safe operation of the network. So that's why we, we've got some of these risky things where people are flowing from a footpath into the road. Um, that is deemed essential work, of which there are people still around to do essential work. Uh, we have a few questions around evaluation, data gathering and evidence uh, from Laurie and a few people seconding that. So, um, and I'm particularly interested in that in, as well. So how are you evaluating these schemes? Yeah, so um, we, in phase two, we had a number of case studies that we followed along and they evaluation and monitoring was a really important part of them. So through those case studies, we've got some good insights um, into different ways and, and a lot of what we're trying to tell with um, help councils with is the intervention logic. So start with what is the problem you are trying to solve here and is it a problem that if this project got into the front page of the newspaper you could explain to people what the problem was. The next thing is so therefore you know what are you doing um, and therefore what does success look like. So your monitoring and evaluation needs to be really closely linked to what you said your problem was. So you can't ve measure vehicle speeds if you said your problem was a not very vibrant business community. Your monitoring needs to be well did we make the business association more vibrant. So we're trying to kind of help with templates to take them through that intervention logic to make sure that what they're getting at this end is answering the question that the, the project is posing, I guess. Um, and yeah, so I mean, practically how we're going to do that is it's a requirement of the funding as a monitoring and evaluation plan. And we've got a few monitoring and evaluation companies um, that will be helping with providing kind of specialist advice on how to do that. Excellent. Um, any other um, participants want to pitch in on evaluation and evidence and monitoring and so on uh, before we move on to the next question? Put, put a hand up using the participant chat so I can find you, if so. I, I want, to, I want to, uh, to add one thing here, is that I think what is crucial in evaluation is that we also really have to think about uh, what we are evaluating. and. Um, uh, you, you already said earlier that it's not only about intervention, it's creating a story. And by, uh, by, by not only counting numbers or vehicles or, or, or miles, but also uh, feelings, emotions and smiles, uh, I think that can also help us to change the narrative and attach it to people outside of our bubble. Because most people are not so interested in the... So in the Netherlands, for instance, all the monitoring currently of COVID is all about um, congestion on the highway which is really odd uh, because there are so many more things to measure, but we're not measuring them. So I would also challenge everybody in these kinds of interventions to really think about uh, measuring the, the, um, the convincing stuff for policymakers, but also measuring things that matter for people. Yeah. One of the things we did try for one of our case studies, I don't know if you guys have them, but in our airports here, once you've gone through security, there's a button, there's a machine that you push the button of how satisfied you were. There's like a smiley face and a not smiley face. And we tried taking that machine out onto the street with a question of, um, how, do you like the street? I can't remember. Do you think the street is a great place? And we got them to push the smiley button or the non-smiley button. And that was to do with a project that's problem was, this is a stink street. We want to make this a cooler street. So that's why that kind of intervention was answering that problem. Um, Aliza, did you have a question? I, hi, Claire. <laughs> we are the same cohort. It's very exciting. Thank you for tonight. Um, Marco really picked up on the same question. I, I am curious to understand how deeply that permeates in this industry. I know kind of the, the monitoring and evaluation, as you said, is always very numbers heavy. It's also distance. It's kind of very technical, very engineer driven. Um, and that social component of our streets as part of the public realm and an extension of our public space where our social lives happen, um, how that how that message is going, getting that out there to kind of understand and what tools are out there to be able to track that in a kind of design sense. We work um, as urban designers and we really need the detail to be able to come back and say, 
on this street at a street scale, which bits are working, what bits aren't, rather than at a whole city scale. Otherwise, it gets a bit hard to implement something like a tactical urbanism project. So just curious kind of what scales you're um, looking at for that monitoring. I'll let um, someone else answer that, but some of the cities are using some of the um, public life surveys, so the Gale um, uh, quality of place stuff. There's a whole range of things, that, and it's quite project specific, but I think somebody else has got. Yep. Go for it, Jolt. Yeah, I think, isn't Tom Bailey, who is one of the, um, I'm not sure what year he was on PCC, but he, he runs a small company that does kind of video surveys and there's a couple of companies in the UK operating that okay you wouldn't necessarily capture the feelings and emotions and smiles but it might be you know you might be able to capture more things like family activity um, and that kind of thing on certain areas um, so t Tom might be one of the people from the previous year um, I've got quite a good app that is easy to download called street behavior um, where it's like a traffic counting app that you can just download and do your own um, custom surveys on it, which I can send around the link, the link to people for as well. Another one you just reminded me, Zolt, another one of the surveys um, that we've been doing is the, a company comes and records how many people are dwelling in the place. So instead of passing through, they're counting people who have stopped, they're counting people who might have disability, they're counting the people number of people sitting on the chairs. So it's quite a, a different sort of count. I'd love to know what that's called because it's also um, an application that we use here that um, I work with called Inhabit Place and we do that scale where you're understanding people dwelling, what seat they're sitting on and it's also interaction so you're asking people's opinions and I just find you get that smile story and it, it's a really powerful message to report up. I think one of the challenges we have at the moment is that we can't, we're, we're discouraging dwelling. So in these strange times, how do we measure people's enjoyment of a space when we're restricting the ways we would normally want them to enjoy it? And from a campaigner's perspective, we're doing everything we can to capture stories, promote stories, keep highlighting the positive role that the bicycle and cycling is playing in people's lives in really challenging times and really trying to get that emotional shift and that emotional evidence, I suppose, when um, data will be really tough and, and any data that we do collect right now will always be somewhat irrelevant because, well, that was not a normal time, not a normal experience. It wasn't for long enough. Um, but we're coming towards the, the last five minutes, so we'll start wrapping up, but there was another, I've missed a lot of questions, I know, but really quickly for you, Claire, before we go to Marco for a bit of a wrap up, um, what about the politicians and sort of the political risk? How are you encouraging them to, to be bold in this time and, and actually try some of these, these um, interventions? Well, it's uh, one of our politicians that has been leading the charge in this whole space. So our Associate Minister of Transport got this whole ball rolling for us. Um, and we, there's a lot of political support at a national level. Um, that I think at the, I, I, I <laughs> it's being recorded. Um, that I think that, you know, that permission thing is the main thing I'd say. I think people want to do something. They know there's good benefits in it. That when it's something outside business as usual there's a sense of risk and there's a sense of liability and so there's a heightened sense of needing permission so the more things you can do and find that give permission and say it's okay it's okay um then that there's more likely you know there's always an intent to get these um outcomes yeah uh patrick do you want to pitch in on that as well from from your perspective as an advocate yeah, sure. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, yeah, in New Zealand, national politics is not really our problem. It comes down to the city level, and that's really where the tough decisions are made. So it's it's great to have money from the government. Um, our jobs as advocates is to show the social license for change, and to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with our with our councillors and in public. Um, I really don't know if there's a shortcut for that, but. I think telling better stories is a key part of that. And I've just flicked one into the chat box from uh, Bike Auckland, one of our groups, about essential health workers who are getting around Auckland by bicycle at this time. So uh, we've got to keep chipping away at it 
find our champions in local government, uh, make the case to them, stay in their ear and, and keep at it. Something, I wonder I if there's any other advocates out there who'd like to add to that. Uh, we've got a, a hand up from uh, Alex yeah. Meyer. So we'll go Alex, then we'll go Claire, and then we'll wrap up uh, with Marco. Go Alex. Sure, cool. Um, yeah, I guess uh, further to that, I just was um, thinking, I, I spoke to my mum earlier today and she said, so cars are a pretty, um, you know, pretty ready-made uh, socially distancing bubble that should be good for health and um, and for coming out of lockdown, right? And uh, and yeah, I was just I was just sort of uh, wanted to put out there to to be prepared for that kind of uh, cultural safety response around the world because I, I I believe I saw an article that said that there's been a a spike in vehicle purchases in China following their coming out of lockdown and uh, just what kind of messaging we can be putting out that's um, really negating the, uh, that kind of uh, knee-jerk reaction um, and just picking up on and, and um, continuing that social distancing, uh, public health messaging because um, it's, and, 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 and all in this together um, framing because uh, everybody that gets in the car is, a base, is basically reducing the, the public space for the remainder of the people who aren't. So that's not in it together, that's not uniting. So um, yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Okay, Claire, I'll let you uh, have your final words and then we'll try and finish close to on time. Okay, two things. One thing, it relates to what Alex said, one thing we learn on our course about communicating strategically for change is that when you surface people's values, they can think more intrinsically about um, doing good things for the world. And the whole world right now has been surfacing everybody's intrinsic values to act, be in it together, let's all, you know, come to collaborate. So we are right at primed, they call it, in advertising, but we have had all of those values surfaced and we should be quite ripe for our campaigning messages to appeal to those intrinsic values in people. Um, and the second thing is something that I saw today, we have a group here called Women in Urbanism, and they're doing a little survey, just a simple little survey right now, asking people about their experiences on the street during lockdown, getting them to share their reflections and to send in photos. And they wanna keep a record of that. And one of their main messages is, this is what people want. We get told all the time, nobody wants to walk and bike, but actually everybody's out there on the street and parents are letting their kids ride their bikes on the street for the first time. They want to do this, but they normally can't. So I think in terms of some of that messaging, if you can capture some of people's reflections right now, um, that's a lot of good content for storytelling in the future. Great to see you all. <laughs> I'll just say thank you so much to uh, Patrick for jumping right on board and arranging for Claire to come and speak to us. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you so much, Claire, for coming and talking to us. Um, We'll have some informal chat afterwards, but just thank you. It's been really amazing and keep up the great work. Uh, and thank you to Marco for helping us make this really big. Marco, I'll hand over to you to sum up and uh, do a little sales pitch for the MOOC as well. Well, thanks uh, Roxanne and, and thanks, thanks all the others. Uh, I have to say that this is, uh, this is a, a very inspiring one hour, um, most inspiring one hour of the last month that I've experienced and it makes me feel, feel very proud to have been able to have you all in Amsterdam or many of you and to see how you are now leading, uh, leading change across the world. And it makes me just very happy to see all your faces. Um, so I've, I've make, been making some notes. So I will uh, use this, uh, uh, this last uh, couple of minutes to make uh, some, some remarks on that because I think what, what really uh, uh, connected with me was indeed, this is, might be the moment for our generation of, of landscape pressure, as you called it, uh, from, from transition theory, this might be it, right? This is our moment. Uh, and this is the moment that we can uh, use landscape, landscape change uh, uh, for, uh, for the better. However, uh, I think we should also be very well aware that there's also other bubbles of people that are trying to do the same. And uh, uh, in the same theory, there are niches that try to now uh, attack the regime from many sides. Uh, so let's be aware that there's also the car industry that is going to sell, trying to sell more cars after this, which is already happening in China and other places. 
So uh, let's remember that Elon Musk will come up with a product uh, as well, and he will be powerful as well. So I think uh, the key thing here is indeed not to focus too much on, on the vehicle and, um, and the bicycle or pedestrian, but to, uh, to tell a different story. So to use this moment to help people realize that we can also speak a different narrative about our streets, that streets are not there uh, only for, uh, for uh, a movement of, of vehicles, because this happened 100 years ago in the 1920s. Uh, this narrative was created also under huge pressure. So if, if there's a lesson from the 1920s, the 2020s should also be used to change the narrative of streets into uh, public spaces for, for people, um, uh, mostly, especially in our cities. Um, so here I can do some advertisement because on, on the May 4th, I will publish a free um, a online a book, which is called Mobility Language Matters. And uh, it's basically capturing this whole story of why it's so important to change the narratives. So I really like also to, uh, uh, to, uh, to give you all a, a compliment because I think one of the things that I'm afraid of is that we are going to say to people how the world will be after this. But I think you, you manage to, to stay confused on a high level. Uh, and, um, and I think that's also the key thing here is that we should keep an open mind. We should keep asking questions. And I think uh, and I hope that the products that we make, such as the massive open online course, the summer school, uh, the documentaries that we made, uh, Why We Cycle and Together We Cycle. But these kinds of products help people now to ask better questions. I think that's, that's the key thing that we, uh, that we should do. So I will put the links to the uh, massive open online course, the summer school and uh, the documentary. Uh, I will put it in the chat in, in a minute, uh, but not before I've thanked again, uh, Roxanne, Patrick, Claire, uh, for, for setting this up in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in two days. Uh, uh, using all the energy there. And I want to raise the question now, um, who's going to do this next? So uh, who's going to, to give us a presentation about their local context uh, next? And then we will just set it up again in, this, uh, in the same fashion, if everybody likes this. Final uh, comment, by the way, for some people that didn't realize that what we are going to do is we're going to put this recording on YouTube uh, because the quality uh, of, of the discussion here, I think, is indeed uh, also a hopeful message um, and um, it will be put on the Urban Cycling Institute's uh, YouTube channel as soon as we have time to, uh, to edit it. So that's it, awesome. And uh, for those who want, let, let's stay, uh, this channel will be open the next half an hour uh, so we can also just uh, uh, catch up. I will stop the recording, so um, thank you very much.